So give him an incredibly warm welcome to the stage right now, the magnificent, the man who in the brochure looks like he can eat your soul, Michael! Thank you very much. Hello. Is everyone having a nice time at QED? Did everyone have a nice time last night? Would you have had as nice a time if we put you in an empty room and told you you were having a nice time? Um, okay, uh, so my name's Mike, some of you might know me, some of you not. I, I do a podcast called Skeptics with a K, and I'm one of the organizers of this conference. Um, I also the person who um, writes the schedule. Um, so here I am in the room with no competition, yay! Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about the history of the police box prop in Doctor Who 1963 to 1976. Um, <laughs> now we're going to be talking about the placebo effect. So, I'm going to start off with, uh, start off with a quote. So at this time of year, it seems like people are constantly warning you that they're coming down with a cold. But if I have a slightly sore throat or a runny nose, I always try to say that I'm fighting off the virus instead. Because the nervous system runs from the brain to every organ of the body, what we believe can have a powerful effect on how we respond to illness. These words were written by Dr. Daniel Glasser. Uh, Dr. Glasser is a former neuroscientist and currently director of science engagement at the Royal Institution. Uh, for many years, Dr. Glasser wrote a column in The Guardian uh, called A Neuroscientist Explains. And for his column in November of 2016, this is what he wrote. Um, the apparent suggestion here being that saying, I'm fighting off a cold instead of I'm coming down with a cold will do something to your cold, whatever that was. He's not specific about what that is, but I think the context is that it's something positive. Dr. Glasser continued, neuroscientists are still trying to work out the specific mechanism uh, behind this link, but the placebo effect is still regularly proven to be one of the strongest medical responses there is. And so it's this, it's the placebo effect um, that I'm going to be talking to you about this morning. Um, now before we get into that, uh, first, uh, before we talk about what the placebo effect is, and uh, I think it's, in, it's interesting to know what the placebo effect is, because I think it's very misunderstood. Before I do that, I want to take a little bit of a step back, because I think before we can talk about what the placebo effect is, we need to understand what a placebo is, what it's for, and how it's used. So the gold standard of clinical research is the randomized placebo-controlled trial. So if you've got a new drug that you want to test, a new intervention, a new treatment of some description, uh, what you would do is you would get a load of people, and you would split them randomly into two groups. It's important that you do this randomly because you don't want to end up with all the healthy people in one group, all the sick people in another, or all the old people in one group, all the young people in another. Uh, so if you do it randomly, then hopefully all those kind of population differences will even out between the groups. Um, and then to one group, you give the new treatment that you want to test, the new intervention, whether that's a drug or a procedure or an exercise or, or, or whatever it is. You give that to the, to the first group. And the second group, they get a placebo, a dummy, a sham, a fake version of the same intervention. So in the, in the case of a drug, um, typically this would be a sugar pill. It would be what you want is something that looks, tastes, smells, and resembles in every possible way the treatment that you're looking to test but has no specific effect for the condition that you're looking to treat. Um, when the differences between the groups um, are, are evened out like this, and so the only difference between them is one of them's got the drug and one of them hasn't, then we can be confident that any differences in health outcomes between those two groups are a result of the active effect of the drug rather than of any other factor. But this is the really important thing. The people who get the fake medicine are also going to get better. People who get the fake medicine recover too. We call this the placebo response. That's different from the placebo effect. There's a distinction between them. I'll explain what that is in a moment. We call this the placebo response. People, uh, patients will recover even when they are in the control group. So let's look at an example of that. Uh, this was a study um, uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2001. 46 patients with mild to moderate asthma were randomized to receive one of four interventions. Uh, the first intervention was an inhaler, a real blue salbutamol inhaler. If, if there are American friends in the audience, you'll know this is albuterol. We call it salbutamol in the, in the EU and Britain. Um, <laughs> 
uh, but yeah, real asthma medication, actual asthma drugs, stuff that you might, you'll know the blue inhaler. You know, you'll have seen them from school. If you're asthmatic, you might still have one. It's you know, the standard inhaler. The second group, they received a sham inhaler, a dummy inhaler, a fake inhaler. It looked exactly like a real salbutamol inhaler, but there was no asthma medication in it. I don't know what was in it, but whatever it was in it was not an asthma treatment. The third intervention, bit of a wild card, sham acupuncture. Uh, this turns out to be because one of the authors of this study was an acupuncturist. Hooray! So they just threw that one in there. Um, and the final group received no treatment, no treatment at all. Um, not even a placebo, not even a fake. They, they got no treatment, they knew they were getting no treatment. And this is problematic for blinding purposes, because people don't necessarily... You, you want people to not know whether they're getting it treated or not because of the placebo effect. Um, so... Uh, yeah, those are the four interventions. Now, this used a crossover design. So rather than uh, having four groups and each gets one treatment, everyone get every treatment, just not all at the same time. Uh, so uh, all of the 46 patients in the study, they each received um, each of these interventions uh, three times over 12 sessions spread over several weeks. And they were asked after each intervention to score the improvement in their asthma symptoms on a scale of 0 to 10 where zero was no improvement at all, and 10 was, I'm cured. What is asthma? I don't even, oh, yeah, I don't even know. I've forgotten what it was like. And the results of this are, are, are really, really interesting. So patients who got the real inhaler, the real um, asthma medication, they reported a 50% uh, improvement, a 5 out of 10 on average. Not a surprise. You give someone with asthma, asthma drugs, they feel better. What a shock. The patients who got no treatment they reported a 21% improvement, a 2 out of 10 on average. And there's good reasons for this. So um, asthma, asthma is one of those things that will respond to time, just sitting down, calming down, deep breathing, relaxing. That can help improve asthma symptoms. Now, that's not to say that asthma isn't a serious condition. Asthma is a dreadfully serious condition. Uh, I think half a million people a year die of asthma. It's, it's not a, a pleasant thing. Um, and, but because it's one of those childhood diseases, we kind of take it a little bit for granted. But it is a serious condition, asthma. Um, but it is something that responds to time. It is something that, you know, if your symptoms aren't too severe, they will calm down over time. But the patients who got the fake inhaler reported a 45% improvement, almost as much as the real inhaler, which is huge. That's astonishing. Patients who got a fake inhaler had a, an improvement in their symptoms almost equal to a real inhaler. Patients who got the sham acupuncture, same thing, 46% improvement, 4.5 out of 10, almost as big as the real asthma medication. In fact, there was no statistically significant difference between these three groups. In, in, in statistical terms, in scientific terms, they performed as well as each other. A fake inhaler is as effective as a real inhaler at improving asthma symptoms. And that's amazing. That is an astonishing piece of science. And we said before that the placebo response is the improvement that you see in the control group. And so you can see here that the placebo response here is massive. The placebo response is the size of the active effect. It's huge, absolutely enormous. And the placebo effect is the difference between the placebo response and what happens if we've done nothing. That's the placebo effect, the difference between what happens in the control group and what happens if we had done absolutely nothing. So you can understand on the basis of data like these why people say the placebo effect is one of the most powerful medical responses there is. You give someone a fake inhaler with no asthma medication in it, tell them it's asthma medication, their symptoms improve as much as if it was a real inhaler. But that's only half the story. This wasn't the only outcome measure that they gathered for this study. They also had a secondary outcome measure. This secondary outcome measure um, used a technique called forced expiratory volume. It's effectively how hard can you blow into a tube. Um, and this is an objective measure of your lung function. Rather than asking, score us on a scale of 0 to 10 how much better you think you are, this is we're going to measure your lungs and see if you are better. Check if you're better. Measure. And the results of this are just as interesting. Strong improvement for the inhaler, again, Asthma medication to an asthmatic, they're going to feel better, not a, not a surprise. Small improvement from their treatment group, again, sit down, cup of tea, deep breathing, you're going to feel a little bit better with asthma. It's one of those conditions that's going to respond uh, to just some time. But when we measured, when we checked, when we objectively measured the patient's lungs, there was no difference between 
the placebo group and the no treatment group. The placebo response here was the same as what happened in the no treatment arm. And as I said before, the placebo effect is the difference between what happens in no treatment and what happens in the placebo response in the control group. So the placebo effect here is nil. The placebo effect here is zero. When we objectively measured the effect that the fake medication had on the patient's lungs, there was no placebo effect. When lung function is objectively measured, placebo had the same effect as no treatment. So why did patients report such a large improvement when we know, when we know from measuring their lungs, from checking the actual function of their lungs, we know that there was no improvement? Well, we also know, because we're skeptics, we know from the fields of psychology and parapsychology that subjective reports like this, reports where the opinions of the patients or the clinician um, are allowed to influence what is recorded in the data, subjective reports like this uh, respond to bias. We know this from like testing psychics and things like this, people who go out and, and investigate ghosts. We know that there are these kind of bias effects. And there are several different ways that this can happen. So one such effect here is the subject expectancy effect. This is where, rather than reporting what is happening, patients report what they think should be happening. And those are two different things. So rather than reporting what is happening, patients tell you what they think should be happening. Another effect very similar to this, this is an effect called demand characteristics. Uh, it's saying very similar. In, in the case of demand characteristics, this is where patients don't report what is happening, they report what they think their doctor wants to hear. And there's good reasons why you might do that as well. You've turned up at the clinic, they've sat you down, they've given you medication, they've, you know, you know, shaking you by the hand and taking care of you. And then they say, are you feeling much better? And you go, yeah, doc, thanks. Because of course you will. Of course you're going to do that. There's a strong social pressure not to be a dick in those circumstances. And so when the doctor says, you feeling better? Yeah, yeah, I guess. I guess a little bit. We've all done that. So this is where you report what you think your doctor wants to hear. Another effect is the Hawthorne effect. This is where patients change their behavior simply because they're taking part in a study. They know the things that they're doing are now being recorded and written down, so instead of behaving like they normally would, they change their behavior, and that can influence their health outcomes. So in the case of the asthma study, for example, if you were taking a brown inhaler, a preventative inhaler, and maybe you're a little bit lax about taking it, but now you know you're in an asthma study, you're going to take it every day, like clockwork, because you know you're meant to. And that's going to actually change your health outcomes. And the final effect that I, I want to talk about, and there are many, many more besides these, these are just a handful that I want to talk about, is recall bias. And this is where patients misremember or misreport a baseline measurement. So in the case of the asthma study, they said, how much better do you feel than before? If you misremember how you felt before, you're going to give a misleading answer. And we, we know, this is, this is the basis of the Mandela effect. Uh, you know, Kit Kat does not have a hyphen in it. Nelson Mandela did not die in prison. Memory is really, really terrible. There are people who will swear blind that these things are true. I don't think patients are lying when they misreport their baseline measurements. They're misleading themselves as much as they're misleading anybody else. So effects like these are really important because they change what is recorded in the data without necessarily changing what is happening in the patient. And when we're dealing with scientific studies, all we have is what's written down. And if there is a difference between what happens and what is written down, that's going to look like what, what is written down is what happens. But this is just one small study. Small numbers, 46 patients, done by an acupuncturist. What we really want to do, I, you know, I, I've picked this cherry for you, right? Um, so what you really want to do, if you want to, to, to know the answer to this question, is there a difference between no treatment and placebo, what you want to do is you want to look at all of the studies, gather all of the data, look at every study that has both a no treatment arm and a placebo arm at the same time, and see is there actually a difference between them. Fortunately, this study has already been done. It's been done a few times, in fact. Uh, the first time it was done was in 2001, where it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, very, very well-regarded study. Uh, there were follow-ups done in 2004 and 2010, the latter of these done for the Cochrane Collaboration. Again, very well-regarded organization, uh, got a very good reputation for producing high-quality studies of this kind. And this uh, paper compared placebo to no treatment. They found all of the papers in the scientific literature that had both a placebo and a no treatment group 
and compared the health outcomes between those two groups. And what they found was that there was no objective placebo effect. When you measure, when you check, when you are taking measurements of real-world things, there is no placebo effect. There is no difference between what happens if you do nothing and what happens if you administer a placebo. They did find subjective effects where the opinions of the clinician and the opinions of the patient are allowed to influence what is recorded. They did find those effects, and those effects they were unable to distinguish from biased reporting. These data were published for the first time 20 years ago. But for some reason, the placebo effect still has this reputation as one of the most powerful medical responses there is. Even though the systematic reviews show that there is no such thing. So, I could just end this talk here. People say there's placebo, there isn't. Hooray! And then, you know, I'm off. But that'll be a, a very short talk, and maybe that's better. Um, but I'm going, to, I'm going to dig in a little bit deeper. Um, so with that background established, I want to look at some of, the, some of the more commonly cited claims for the powerful placebo and dig into those claims a little bit more. So placebos are not a new thing. References to the use of placebos in medicine go back hundreds and hundreds of years. But the modern idea of a powerful therapeutic placebo um, was um, popularized by this gentleman. This is a chap called Henry K. Beecher. Um, Henry Beecher was a doctor, he was a medical doctor, and he served in the Second World War. He graduated from Harvard Medical School in 1930. Um, during the Second World War, he served in uh, North Africa and Southern Italy in army field hospitals. And as the story goes, when um, Beecher one day ran out of saline um, at, his, at his field hospital, or ran out of morphine rather, at his field hospital, and decided to administer saline instead. And to his surprise, it worked just as well as the morphine did. And if you were at Skeptic Camp yesterday, you'd have seen Jonathan Jarry talk about this and how there's actually no evidence that this, these circumstances took place at all. Uh, it doesn't appear in Beecher's writings anywhere, it doesn't appear in any of his private notes, any of his scientific papers. They're, they're, this appears to have been, it doesn't appear in his obituary, this appears to have been something that was made up after the fact. Um, what we do know happened is that after the war, Beecher wrote a paper titled The Powerful Placebo. Um, this uh, paper was published um, in 1955, I think it was, um, and it was a, uh, a, a review that he did of um, literature that looked at the placebo effect. Um, and it is still probably the most cited um, paper in the placebo effect literature. So this was a review of 15 studies comprising over 1,000 patients. Uh, Beecher says that he um, selected the studies randomly, but given that he was an author or co-author on seven of the 15 papers, I'm not convinced quite how random that was. Um, and what he found was that 35% of patients responded to the administration of a placebo alone. That was what he found in the paper. 35% of patients responded to a placebo alone. A degree not widely recognized, he wrote in the paper at the time. But a 1997 reanalysis of those original 15 papers um, found some quite different conclusions. Two researchers in 1997 went back to the original 15 studies that Beecher looked at, and they came to some very different conclusions. They found that there was no placebo effect. In any of the 15 papers that Beecher had cited, there was no convincing evidence for a real therapeutic placebo effect but they did find several things that could give a false impression of a placebo effect if you failed to account for them in your statistics. So one of those things is spontaneous improvement. You get 100 people with a cold, you give them all a placebo, and you wait three weeks. <laughs> They're all better, right? And that's not because the placebo did anything, it's because colds get better in a couple of weeks. That's spontaneous improvement, that happens. Remarkable uh, how often this is overlooked in the placebo effect literature, including in Beecher's papers. Another effect is fluctuation of symptoms. So especially with a chronic condition, you're going to have um, good days and you're going to have bad days. You're going to have days when your symptoms are at their worst, where they're, 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 you're in the absolute doldrums, and some days that aren't as bad. And you're going to fluctuate between the two. And just by chance, just by coincidence, there's going to be some patients where you take the baseline measurement, the measurement you take at the start of the study, you're going to take the baseline measurement on a bad day, on the worst day. Which means, in all probability, the endpoint measurement, the measurement you take at the end of the study, is going to be on a better day. It's not going to be worse than the worst. 
So if we take the baseline measurement on the worst day, it's probably going to be better uh, at the endpoint measurement, not because of anything that's happened, but just because symptoms vary over time. Now you might be saying, hey Mike, that's true, but there's also a chance that you'll take the baseline measurement on a really good day, and so the endpoint is going to be taken on a really bad day. But it turns out that isn't the case. And the reason that isn't the case is patients do not enroll in clinical trials on their good days. They enroll in clinical trials on their bad days, because that's when they go to the doctor and say, I'm really, really struggling with this, and the doctor says, well, there's this trial I can put you in, we'll see about that. And even that minor effect will be enough to skew our data um, into the positive. Um, another effect that uh, Beecher often fails to consider, and a lot of the placebo effect literature fails to consider, is parallel intervention. This is where you take something else at the same time as the placebo, and it's that which is improving your symptoms, not the placebo itself. Worse than this, you've got unrecorded parallel interventions. This is where you take something else at the same time as a placebo, and you don't tell your doctor that you did it. Or you do tell your doctor, and they don't write it down. And if it doesn't go in the paper, it looks to the rest of the scientific community like it didn't happen. In fact, none of the 15 studies that Beecher cites in the powerful placebo have a convincing effect for placebo. They all fall foul of one of these effects or one of a handful more that was identified in the 1997 paper. These confounders are not unique to Beecher's work by any stretch. They appear all over the placebo effect literature. Um, something that prompted the authors of the 1997 paper to say something about the placebo topic invites sloppy methodological thinking. So how does this actually play out in the primary literature for the placebo effect? This is a chap called Daniel Mormon. Daniel Mormon is an anthropologist and an ethnobotanist. Um, uh, he's attached to the, I think he's emeritus professor at the University of Michigan at Dearborn now. And he's author of a book called Meaning Medicine and the Placebo Effect. And in an editorial for the New England Journal of Medicine in 2001, um, he wrote this. He said, clinicians often dress up in special uniforms that convey power and authority. They have very expensive machines that can look inside your heart or brain. The magnificence of the hospital building, the computers on every lap, the caring nurse, it piles up meaning with increasing power regardless of what may be in the capsule or the syringe. These meanings create expectations that can dramatically modify the effectiveness of even the most powerful proven treatments. And it's no surprise really that an anthropologist thinks it's all about cultural meaning any more than a reductionist, like me, thinks it's all about bias. But this emphasis on the anthropology of it all, on, on this idea of ritualistic ele elements changing outcomes, fails to draw a distinction between the efficacy of an intervention and the report of an efficacy of an intervention. They are two distinct things. They're related. Obviously, they're related, but they are distinct. What happens and what we say happens are not always the same thing. In 1983, Mormon published a paper um, called Placebo Effects in the Treatment of Peptic Ulcers. Um, this was an analysis of um, uh, placebo-controlled trials for the drug cimetidine. Cimetidine is or was a drug that was very commonly prescribed for uh, stomach ulcers. Uh, and so what, Beach, uh, what uh, Mormon did is he took uh, all of the papers published between 1977 and 1980 investigating the drug cimetidine. Um, he took the data, he threw away the active treatment data and just looked at the placebo data. And what he found was that in some trials conducted in some countries, as many as 90% of patients recovered from their peptic ulcers after the administration of a placebo alone. 90% in some countries. In other countries, it was as few as 10%. Some other countries, as little as 10%. Um, this prompted Mormon to comment that it is possible, therefore possible, to heal peptic ulcers in almost everyone with the administration of an inert treatment. But this huge variability, this is huge variability. Some, some studies show 10% recovery rates, some studies show 90% recovery rates. That's not a reliable, sensible effect. The, the, you know, is, there, is this the amazing power of the mind over the body, or is there some other explanation for this data? Mormon speculates in the paper, very briefly, he says maybe patients were taking antacids at the same time. Maybe some patients were taking antacids and didn't tell our doctors about it. There'd be an unrecorded parallel intervention. He just as quickly dismisses this idea and says, no, no it couldn't possibly be that, because it turns out the data on antacids 
for stomach ulcers is really terrible. There's no good data that uh, antacids are really effective in the treatment of stomach ulcers. So he says, maybe it's this, but it's not. And then he moves on. Therefore, it must be the amazing power of the mind over the body, ritualistic elements, um, changing real-world outcomes. But just because it is not antacids doesn't mean it wasn't something else. Notably, these data were gathered between 1977 and 1980. The study was um, conducted in 1982, presented at conference, published in 1983. All of this is before the widespread acceptance that Heliobacter pylori is the cause for almost all stomach ulcers. So although patients may have been advised to avoid taking antacids during the study, they probably weren't advised to avoid taking antibiotics during the study. And turns out Heliobacter pylori is cured by penicillin. So patients could have been administering antibiotics for something completely unrelated and accidentally curing their stomach ulcers at the same time, which would also account for the geographic variability that we see, because some countries in the late 70s and early 80s were handing out antibiotics much more readily than other countries. This was before the antibiotic crisis, where we realized that handing out antibiotics like sweets actually breeds antibiotic resistance. We didn't know that at the time. So often patients would go to doctors with a viral infection and say, just give me something, just give me a medicine, and the doctor would write them a prescription for antibiotics just to get them out the door. It's not going to harm them, so I'll just give them something so they feel like they've been paid attention to. It's not a great way to do medicine. It's very paternalistic. It's something that medicine tries to avoid these days. But it happens, and it did happen. And it's entirely possible that this is the case. A parallel intervention can explain the variability that we see, the geographic variability that we can see. And at the very least, it needs to be ruled out before we can start making confident assumptions about how ritualistic elements change real-world outcomes. Several years later, Mormon wrote uh, another study. Um, it was uh, a study that was published in 1993. He was a co-author on this. You may have heard about this study. This is a favorite of Ben Goldacre. He talks about this a lot. He talks about, he talked about this study on QI. He talked about it in Nine Lessons and Carols with Robin Inns. He stood up at Radio 4. Um, he did a video for the, the NHS website on this study. where the, So the NHS was making these claims as well. Um, so between 1977 and 1994, there was a change in the way that... Um, uh, ulcer medication was administered. In the 70s, we were giving out uh, a, a treatment uh, plan that required you take pills four times a day, once with each meal and then um, uh, once before bedtime. But by the 90s, we'd changed the treatment plan, and so we had uh, uh, drugs that you would administer only twice a day, once in the morning, once at bedtime. And over the course, you know, between 1977 and 1994, <laughs> Um, they, uh, the, the studies would gradually move from one to the other. And so what, uh, what the authors did, including Daniel Mormon, is they took this data, they discarded the active treatment data, and what they had now was a corpus of data that showed um, uh, the difference between patients who were had a load of patients in this, in this data who took placebos four times a day, and a load of patients in the data who took placebo twice a day, and they looked at the differences in the health outcomes between those two groups. And... Ulcers are really good for this. Ulcers are really good for this kind of treatment because it's got an objective outcome. Your, your ulcer is healed or it hasn't. Um, the, it, it's not, you know, do you feel a little bit better, Mrs. Smith? It's just uh, you, you've got an objectively measurable outcome. So the, the outcome here is they measure it by endoscope. So we've got patients who, some patients are taking placebos twice a day, some patients are taking placebos four times a day, and in every case, the doctors have stuck a camera down their throat um, to see if the, uh, the ulcer has healed. So the end point of this study was a healed ulcer. Has the ulcer healed? Stick a camera down the throat, the doctor looks down the camera and sees whether this is a healed ulcer or not. Now, as we saw in the asthma study, bias can count, uh, can, uh, can count for a significant portion of the placebo response that we measure. And trials like this don't have a no-treatment wing. All we have is the placebo response to work with. And we know bias can count, account for a significant fraction of that. So is there room in this study for bias, for, for someone's opinion to influence what was written in the data? 
So let's do a thought experiment. Let's imagine we've got two doctors taking part in two studies. One's in a four-pill study, one's in a two-pill study. They're taking part in studies that happened, you know, 10 years apart. One in 77, one in 87. So they don't know each other in different countries, doing different things, different people. And they're looking at two different patients. And let's imagine, for the sake of argument, these two patients are in exactly the same condition. They're in exactly the same state. Their ulcer is in the same condition, and that condition is more or less healed. Just about there, just about done. So the first doctor sticks the camera down the first patient's throat and has a look and says, well, that's just about done, and puts a tick in the healed, cali, uh, healed tally. And the second doctor takes the second patient, sticks the camera down their throat, and looks at an ulcer that is in exactly the same condition and says, yeah, that's not quite there, and puts a tick down in the not healed tally. The patients are in exactly the same condition, but they are recorded differently in the data depending on the opinion of the doctor, the biases of the doctor. So I don't think you can meaningfully compare placebo data across trials like this. You can't take the placebo data of a study done in 1977 and compare it to the placebo data of a study done in 1994. As you said before, when we're doing these kind of studies, you have to keep everything the same between the two groups because you want, when you subtract the, uh, the, the, the variability, the biases, the age groups, when you subtract all that, you want them to be the same in the two groups so they cancel out when you compare the data. And if you're comparing data from 1990, uh, 1977 to 1994, the biases aren't the same anymore. You're now comparing the bias of a doctor in 1994 to the bias of a doctor in 1977. So different clinicians have different biases, and that allows for the bias of the clinician to impact the data. The two-pill studies are also more modern. By 1994, we were pretty much exclusively on two-pill treatment plans. The four-pill treatment plans were all older, but we tend to get better at doing controlled trials over time. The newer trials are probably done with more rigor, probably done with tighter controls over, over a period of time compared to the older studies. And Buried in the bottom of this paper was this fact. If you exclude the data before 1980, exclude just the oldest data, and only look at the data from 1980 to 1994, so exclude the data prior to 1980, this effect disappears. They try to bury this in the paper. They say, there is still an effect, but it's not statistically significant. That means there's not an effect, mate. That's what that means. So as much as people go around saying, hey, taking placebos four times a day will cure gastric ulcers faster than taking placebo. No, that's not what these data say. Another favorite of placebo effect fans is this paper. This is Crum and Langer, 2007. Uh, this one is cited in Bad Science. It's cited, uh, on the, it was cited on the BBC's More or Less program earlier this year. They, uh, they trumpeted this study. Um, we wrote in and said, hey, you got that wrong. So they had me on. Uh, and I said, hey, you've got that wrong. And then they got the first guy on and went, yeah, Mike's wrong. <laughs> Didn't tell me that, just transmitted it. First I knew was when it went out, but okay. So in this study, 84 women who worked as um, hotel room attendants um, were recruited into the study. And uh, what they did is they took these women and they uh, split them into two groups. And one group was told, did you know that the work you do cleaning hotel rooms every day um, counts as uh, good exercise. It counts as, as, as great exercise. Cleaning hotel rooms, in fact, meets the Surgeon General's recommendations for a healthy and active lifestyle. So they told one group of women that. The other group of women, they didn't give that information to at all. And then they sent them back off to clean hotel rooms. And uh, a few weeks later, they came back. And this is what they found. They found that the women who had been told that the work they do cleaning hotel rooms um, counts as good exercise, had lower mean weight, lower body mass index, lower waist to hip ratio, lower body fat percentage, lower blood, pr blood pressure. Just by being told that the work you are already doing counts as exercise. Participants did not report doing any additional exercise outside of work. They asked them, how much do you exercise outside of work? They didn't report any additional exercise um, at the end point of the study. And they also didn't, didn't report any change in their calorie intake. And therefore, if they're not exercising more, and if they're not eating less, the only, difference, the only thing that could have made this difference in all of these um, uh, metrics is their mindset, a change in their mindset. And the author said these results support the hypothesis that exercise affects health in part or in whole via the placebo effect. 
But the claim that exercise works better or doesn't, depending on whether you reckon you're doing exercise, is something we've got to subject to critical appraisal. How do we know that there was no change in their activity levels? They told us there was no change in their activity levels, but how do we know? One possible confounder here could be the Hawthorne effect. It could be that they weren't doing... They, they said, I walk to work every day, definitely, yes, I do. They didn't, they got the bus, but now they start walking to work every day because they know they're taking part in a study. So that's a possibility. Cleaners may have also been cleaning a little bit harder, with a bit more vim, a little more spring in their step, a little more rigor, knowing, hey, this is actually doing me some good. Maybe, maybe that's the case. The authors tried to control for this, but the control that they had for this was going to the housekeeping manager and saying, are they working any harder? And the manager went, no. <laughs> and that's the control. That was therefore they could not possibly have worked harder. They could not have possibly been doing any additional exercise. But it's not like the housekeeping managers are following the room attendants from room to room to see how hard they're scrubbing, right? That's, that's not how this works. And again, as we often see in placebo effect research, these are small numbers, limited data set. Um, at very least, this study would need to be replicated before we start going around telling people that doing exercise while you reckon you're doing exercise is different to doing exercise when you don't. Happily, the replication has already happened. Um, a few years later, somebody replicated this study. This was Stanford 2011. Uh, this was published in the American Journal of Health Behavior. 53 university building service workers were randomized into two groups. And one were told, did you know that the work you do cleaning university campus rooms every day meets the Surgeon General's recommendation for a healthy and active lifestyle? And the other group were given a lecture on safety, something you know, utterly irrelevant, and they were sent off to do their jobs. And they came back several weeks later, and they found absolutely sod all. No difference. This study massively failed to replicate. And when I pointed this out to more or less, they said it's got smaller numbers than the other studies, so we're going to pay attention to the first one. And that is problematic. It's problematic that this is a smaller study. Typically, you wouldn't want to do that with a replication. But at very least, we should not be uncritically citing the hotel room attendant study as evidence for a real therapeutic placebo effect when the only attempt to replicate it showed that it did not replicate. So I've been talking for a while now. Um, there's just one more, one more study that I'm going to talk about. Um, this is a study on um, placebo surgery. This is a go-to paper, again, for placebo effect fans. Uh, this appeared in the BBC's Horizon program. Uh, I think it was uh, last year or the year before. They did an hour-long puff piece on how brilliant placebos were. 300-odd um, patients with shoulder pain uh, were uh, from 32 hospitals across the UK um, were randomized into three groups. The first group received decompression surgery. This is where they open up the shoulder and they removed soft tissue and bone spurs and you know, they, they actually remove material from the shoulder to attempt to relieve pressure and hopefully reduce the pain um, that the patient is experiencing. The second group received placebo surgery, fake surgery, and what this means is they opened them up but they did not remove any material. They didn't remove bone spurs, they didn't take out soft tissue, they opened the patient up, they sewed them back up again. And the third group received no treatment. No treatment at all. They were told, you're on a waiting list for an operation, but the operation never came. And the primary outcome measure for this was uh, a self-reported questionnaire, so again, a lot of room for bias here, um, called the Oxford Shoulder Score. It's a great questionnaire. It's the standard questionnaire that's used in this kind of trial. It's not like they were trying to scam the data here. This is totally the appropriate way to do this trial, um, uh, especially over a long period of time, people with chronic shoulder pain. These are the results. So there was no significant difference between the sham surgery and the real surgery. No difference between what happens when they fake the operation and what happens when they did the real operation. Strong showing for no treatment here, by the way. Good strong showing for no treatment. But no statistical difference between the sham surgery and the real surgery. The BBC called this a miraculous recovery. Um, they, they said this demonstrates the power of placebo. The surgery works even when you fake it. The surgery works even when you don't do the real surgery. No! <laughs> if your surgery doesn't work any better than placebo, it means the surgery doesn't work. It doesn't mean your placebo does. 
That's what it's for. That's why we do placebo-controlled trials. It means removing bone spurs and soft tissue from somebody's shoulder is not an effective intervention for the relief of this kind of shoulder pain, of subacromial shoulder pain. That's, that's not what this, it, it's not an effective treatment for this condition. And the authors of the treatment agree, uh, the authors of the paper agreed. They said these findings question the value of this operation for these indications and should be communicated to patients during the decision making process, process. The authors knew that this showed the operation doesn't work. However, the sham surgery was still better than no treatment was still better than doing nothing at all. The BBC, as I say, described this as a miraculous recovery. They interviewed people. She was out pruning roses in her garden, going, my shoulders are great, Nick, now. Miraculous recovery. And it's only a small improvement. It's not, you know, there's not a massive difference between the heights of those two bars, but it is statistically significant. It is a statistically significant improvement. So why might that be? Why might we have seen a statistically significant improvement here? This is a questionnaire, so there could be bias in here. Um, could, could it be statistical regression? It's a long-term chronic shoulder pain. Could there be statistical regression in there, changing, changing things, fluctuation of symptoms? How about a parallel intervention? Surgical groups had better outcomes compared to no treatment. This difference was not clinically important. But the difference between the surgical groups and no treatment might have been a result of the placebo effect or the physiotherapy they gave them. Because everyone in the surgery groups got post-operative physiotherapy to help them get over the surgery. And that could be what has improved their shoulder mobility than their shoulder pain, not the placebo effect. The BBC described this as a miracle. But it turns out to be a clinically irrelevant uh, effect that can be explained by a parallel intervention that is right there in the paper. So I hope I've been able to explain to you over the, the, you know, the last, what, 40 minutes why I'm so skeptical of the placebo effect. Within the medical community, the public, and even within academia, it's often described as being real and powerful, one of the strongest medical responses there is. But the evidence for the placebo effect is weak and it's inconsistent. Far from being a miraculous insight into the amazing power of the mind over the body, I would contend that the placebo effect is a modern medical myth. Thank you very much. <laughs>